joining us. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Crow. Today, I'm honored to be in the presence of a good friend of mine in her uh, studio. Uh, I'm going to ask you three simple questions. Okay, first one is, what is your name? Where were you born? And what is your life purpose? Tell us. Ooh, the third one is deep. All right, so my name is Megan Corredo. I was born in Washington, D.C. And my life purpose, that is really deep. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of my life purpose is to help other people find themselves, find their strengths and their creativity. And I think the other part of it is for me to find the same thing for myself. I, that was deep, just the way you shared that. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So we're having a little conversation on the drive to your studio. And you were sharing with me about um, what it took for you to become a doctor, to get your doctorates. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like how, how did that manifest? What was your dedication like? Sure, so um, to be honest, I didn't really know why I needed my doctorate. Um, I'm like, hmm, I'm a woman of color, I'm young, and I just wanna be listened to. Mm -hmm. So I applied to different doctoral um, programs and I got into one um, several years before I got into Penn. And it just didn't feel right. Um, I was like, hmm, this would be cool to get into the program. Um, I was accepted, but I, it just didn't feel right. So I hmm. said, no, I passed off on that opportunity. Then I reapplied at the same place, maybe two years before, and they rejected me. And I'm like... <laughs> now they rejected you. Yes. Got it. So I'm like, wow, so I was, I was accepted and I was rejected. Mm -hmm. And then I was feeling really down about it. Like, mm -hmm. what changed? Uh, and then I applied uh, to the program at Penn. They have a doctoral program, um, DSW, Doctor of Social Work. And I didn't really know why I wanted to get into the program other than that I wanted to have a voice and I wanted to have as many things as I could behind my name so that people could listen to me. Because I'm like, if they, they can listen to me, then they'll also listen to the clients mm -hmm. that I'm working with. And urban, view, urban youth often don't have a voice. Right. So... Got into the program, um, but when I got into the program, I actually didn't have a place to live at the time. Mm -hmm. So I got the letter forwarded from my old address to my new address, which was a family member's house where I was wow. staying temporarily. Um, and I got the letter, I was so excited, but then I'm like, how am I going to get there? How am I gonna pay for this? What am I gonna do? Um, so I kind of just took a leap of faith and was like, I'm gonna figure out a way because this doctorate is important and I don't know why, but um, I need to get back to Philly. I had moved away at the time. I need to get back to Philly so I can get in this program. So uh, I packed all my uh, stuff up uh, and I came back to Philly. I didn't have a job yet. I had like little contracting work I was doing and I stayed with a friend. She uh, had no electric in her house at the time. Yeah. So I did my schoolwork using an electric lantern and I would actually, it's funny, so I would actually uh, take an all-in-one scanner, printer, copier to Panera. Panera was my spot and I knew the exact booth where I could use the outlet yeah. and I would plug in my all-in-one scanner, <laughs> copier, printer and I got all my work done. Whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. I would Whatever stay at the takes. library some nights until like 12 o'clock in the morning wow. and um, no one at the school knew that that's what I was experiencing and eventually, you know, I got back on my feet. Yeah. Um, I was able to get into my own space with electric <laughs> and I wow. remember, wow. yes, the first night I, uh, I got into the new apartment uh, mm. I just turned all the lights on. Mm. I was like, yes, all the lights. And I didn't even wow. have my uh, bed in there yet. I slept on the floor. Mm. I was like, it's fine. I have lights and the water right. is hot and I am getting my doctorate and mm. I have my A's and it's okay. Wow, it's a powerful story. <laughs> so it's just, I, I hear stories like yours and it, almost, it moves me to almost tears because I'm like, yo man, I have no reason to complain. Like if you want to do something, just focus and do it. My question to you, where did you get that determination, that focus, like how, where, how? Like, um, I think that part of my survival throughout my life was connected mm. to my drive. Mm. Um, so even when things weren't perfect, even when things 
were rocky and rough. Um, I just always had this ambition, whether it was um, ambition with writing or ambition in school or ambition um, on our basketball team. Mm -hmm. Like I just, that drive just kept me going when a lot of circumstances told me to quit. Wow. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, upbringing? And the reason for that question is because I'm talking to different people from different walks of life about their ideas, uh, their wisdom of how to bridge the gap between youths and adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, so part of that I always ask, like, can you tell us a little bit of how you, your upbringing, you know, was it, you know, it sounds like it was a little bit uh, difficult, you know, so would you care to share a little bit about that? Sure, so uh, things were definitely not perfect. Um, there was a lot of conflict in the household where I grew up. Um, I didn't have the support of a father. Um, and I also uh, hid inside of myself a lot as a child to try and escape some of the pain that was happening around me. Um, but then thinking about how to bridge the connection between uh, kids and adults, there were key figures, key adults throughout my childhood mm -hmm. that encouraged me to keep going. That's what's up. So we need those mentors. We need those role models. That's what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. So I was just reflecting on this the other day and it's just so powerful. Um, when I was in kindergarten, I had a teacher and her name was Miss mm -hmm. Copes. And I was four years old in the kindergarten mm -hmm. and uh, I actually ended up skipping the first grade um, because my teacher said that the first grade was gonna be too easy for me. Wow. But I knew uh, when I came to school that I was gonna be loved, that I was gonna mm -hmm. be hugged, that I was gonna learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had nap time. I remember uh, my mom wanted me to have a special mat because she didn't want me just laying on any old mat. Right, right, so right. everyone else's was blue and mine was like blue on one side and pink on the other side. Cause Word. she was like, no, this is your mat, Megan. Uh, but I barely used my mat because um, my kindergarten teacher would always pull me out, um, pull me out of different things and pull me out of nap time to teach me more things. Oh. And it was like she saw the potential in me and I didn't even know the potential in me. I was just four years old in kindergarten. Wow. And I remember that there was this uh, sign next to the clock and I can still envision it now. I'm like looking up like the clock is there right now. Um, but she had like the, um, the alphabet and then to the right of the alphabet, there was a clock and then there was a sign. And the sign says it can't, then the NT and can't was crossed out. So mm -hmm. then it actually said it can be done. Wow. And I remember looking at that every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember thinking it can't, no, it can't be done. Wow. It can't, no, it can be done. And that picture has been etched in my mind since the age of four and it's been etched in my heart even when things have been difficult. Mm -hmm. No, when I'm thinking it can't be done, when the struggle is too difficult, when the trauma hurts too mm -hmm. much, um, when the pain is too strong, I envision that in my mind. No, it can wow. be done. And then another thing, so at the end of our morning announcements and the afternoon mm -hmm. announcements every day, they would always say, I know that if I work at this, I can do it. And that those messages um, from an early age, starting um, before my kindergarten teacher, but that's that's a story that really um, is resonating with me right now, yeah. where you have these messages, no, you can keep doing it, you can. You can do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, this does seem insurmountable, but you can find your inner strength and you can keep going. And I got that message from multiple people in my life. Um, I got that message from my mom. I got that message from mentors in the community. I got that message from teachers. And it was just uh, kind of ingrained in me from a very early age. And it enabled me to survive a lot of things. Wow. So even having like written affirmations in the space where you're going to school at or even at home, is that kind of like a suggestion? Absolutely. Um, something that you can use to remind yourself mm -hmm. every day um, can be really, really powerful and it's like that consistent message that you yeah. see yeah, yeah. no matter where you are uh, whatever walk of life you're in or whatever struggle you're going through mm -hmm. um, if you have these messages 
etched in your mind of who you are and what you can accomplish, it's really powerful and it sticks with you. I love that. And that's what you're doing now through your practice for other people, right? Mm -hmm. Because, well, how, what's the right terminology? Like, a, you're a clinical therapist, mm -hmm. right? And you you provide that for others now, right? Mm -hmm. Giving them that those affirmations, giving them that guidance, right? Mm -hmm. And helping them find the strength in themselves. Um, a lot of the people that I work with um, are the people that are ignored, that are marginalized, mm -hmm. that, are, that are considered to be powerless. And uh, I get excitement and joy over supporting them and finding their strengths too and saying, mm -hmm. okay, you feel like this can't be done, but how can it? And how can you work around all these challenges and barriers to find yourself? Is it usually, is it all ages or that you work with? So, or is it mainly youth? So I work mainly with youth, but then I also work with families too. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one's more difficult? The the individual youth or the family? You're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we'll skip that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know what, you're right because um, this is what you do for a living, you know what I mean? I I go and, and, and talk to different people but it's just out of the bottom of my heart, you know? And, and same thing, I gotta be careful of not saying something that, you know, I, I, I'm not a doctor, you know, <laughs> so I gotta just Mm -hmm. Share, you know, up to where I feel it's it's uh, more general mm -hmm. thoughts and suggestions, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. So, I created this program called Stories to support people in telling their narratives creatively. Um, it supports people looking back at their past traumas and their past strengths, organizing mm -hmm. them, and then looking toward their future vision. So, saying, in light of the things I've experienced, this is where I want to go from here. Um, as I created it, and it started as part of my doctoral work um, mm -hmm. while I was working on my dissertation, I was, uh, I went through a whole lot of trauma in the course of me creating this narrative process to help other people. And I've always done better with helping to support other people and helping them find their strength and then forgetting to find my own. Uh, so where I am now is I'm still supporting other people in finding their strengths, but I'm also trying to devote time and attention to really understanding myself mm -hmm. and how I view myself, um, the impact of my experiences on my identity, and figuring out how can I drive my future. Um, the same way that I support other people in identifying their future vision, how can I do the same thing for myself? And how can I find value and worth in myself the same way I find value and worth in other people? You know, I, I run into that quite a bit, actually, is people that are working in different fields, but they're going 100% and they're doing so much. They're doing, like, a lot. And people are, like, they, we're blessed to have people like you that are, like, we're here to empower and give back to you. But uh, upon talking to them, that's kind of what I run into is where people are like, you know what? Uh, I need to rest mm -hmm. or I need to you know just pamper myself or I need to eat better um, so definitely I think that's 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 a must you know I, I myself I, I travel a lot for work and, and we we're talking on the phone last time about this um, I I the way I see my life is like it goes up and down and when I'm up, I'm present, I'm here, let's do it, I'm 100%, let's work, I'm here to work. Mm -hmm. And then when I go back home, it's my safe space. Mm -hmm. And because I work for myself, uh, I pass on, on on opportunities and I pass on on projects because I know I don't ha I will not give it 100% to them because I need mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm leaving money on the table, I'm leaving opportunities on the table, but truthfully, the way I see it is like, There'd be none of that is there if there's none of me. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm not, if I'm like, if I get really ill, and that's what happened. I started getting really ill at one point, mm -hmm. just from going nonstop, 100% daily. Mm -hmm. I got really ill to the point I landed in the hospital, and that experience to me was like, I will never be in this hospital again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because even though they treated me good and all that, I, I just, I didn't like the space. It just felt mm -hmm. really not good for me. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, I was like, I need to make sure that I, I'm calibrated, you know, and that I, I am able to be good with myself before I go out and share, you know? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so 
So that's good. That's good that you're on that on that path. And one of my self care strategies is making art, um, and I just love playing with art. Mm -hmm. um, I use my alcohol inks, and I have my glass, and I try new things. And sometimes I hate what I made, and sometimes I love it. Um, sometimes I throw what I made on the floor. I just saw something that you're on the floor. I'm like, I'm like, wait, I'm like, look, these are powerful. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'll come back to it later. I hear you. I'll throw it on the floor and then come back to it again. And then, but everything is like this learning experience um, mm. to say, oh, this is how I can make this again. Or this is how I can never make this again. Mm. Um, I love that. I find when I'm not being creative, though, um, I feel really depleted. And I can tell when I haven't been using my creative self care strategies. Yeah. I can tell. Um, just from my mood and my ability to manage stress, like I need that creativity okay. in order to keep going. And if I don't have it, it's really <laughs> difficult. Gonna, there's going to be problems. It. Yes. Um, <laughs> like, where is my glass and my hammer? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm the same way. And Irene already knows me. My wife already knows me so well that she's like, Crow, just go to your studio. Go to your, it's time, go work. Um, Make something. Exactly. Because, same thing. I, it's, Art, similar to you, it's always, art's always been a healing agent to me, mm -hmm. always. And that's why I now do, very, I guess very similar to you, but I'm not a doctor. I'm going out there sharing from my heart. And, mm -hmm. But it's because what I saw by me creating to help me heal and cope with certain trauma that I had within me, it, um, I then realized, like, you know what, I can share this with people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's very, it's very simple, but it's just a matter of doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you just by once you start seeing people, as I'm sure you've seen, people are just start, let's say, playing with the paints or something. And you just see it in their face, like, whoa, mm -hmm. I tapped into some new information, mm -hmm. and that was that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all need creativity to heal and live and to thrive. Like whether that looks like alcohol inks or spray paint yeah. or acrylics or collage, I think I think we all need it as mm -hmm. human beings. Um, when I'm not making, there's something in me that's like yearning to come out. Yeah. And then I think it's amazing that art speaks for us or creativity um, speaks for us in ways that we can't communicate in words. So in my profession, um, I went through all this different training to learn how to use words to help people right. heal. And then I'm also finding, yes, words can help people heal, right. but all these um, things that we can do using our hands and our creative spirits and um, just finding inspiration, that helps us heal too. Yeah, yeah I found like, uh, like even abstraction, just throwing paint and you know, expression and that also says things that we can't put into words. Mm -hmm. you know? And something about that you look at and you're like, I, I understand where you're at. Mm -hmm. you know? So, hmm. so um, I guess I can tell you about this mannequin that I made. It was in a show. Okay. Um, so I don't know why I wanted to create Arnold mannequins. <laughs> I have three for some reason. I like him. I may have more at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and it's funny how I found two of the mannequins. They were having a going away sale at this uh, at this department store. And my family was with me and I was like, look, there's mannequins and they're cheap. <laughs> so like uh, my sister grabbed like an arm, my cousin grabbed a leg, my mom grabbed a torso mm. and we're traipsing through the mall after I got these mannequins. And uh, I picked plus size mannequins because I wanted it to look like a real person. Like not like this ideal of beauty that we're trying to achieve. Mm. Like no, someone that looks like an everyday person walking right. down the street. <laughs> um, so I got one of the mannequins and I tried this pour painting technique on it. Okay. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I was like, cool. um, like you're using gravity to move the mm -hmm. paints around. Yeah, um, yeah. And it has this marbleizing effect. So I did that to one of the mannequins and I'm like, cool. Okay, it's done. But then I was like, it's too perfect. And whenever I'm making something, I want to keep challenging myself. Mm -hmm. And if it's too perfect, then I want to keep going with it. I hear you. So then uh, one day I was feeling, so as part of my own trauma, um, I also experienced some shame and I went back to the mannequin and I just started like writing all these shameful messages mm -hmm. all over the mannequin, just like messing up this so-called perfect pour painted mannequin that I made. And uh, I left it here in the okay. studio and then 
I went about my business. And then I said, you know what, I can't. It felt like that mannequin was representing me and how I was treating myself and the messages I was saying mm -hmm. to myself. Wow. And I said, I can't leave myself in this. Mm -hmm. um, so I came back to it. And then I covered it up with positive messages. There we go. Um, uh, I said things like, uh, you are beautiful, you are good enough. Mm -hmm. um, things that I don't usually tell myself. Okay. And I covered up all of those areas of shame with mm -hmm. positive yeah. messages about myself. And then I, I ended up adding pictures, um, photographs of me feeling confident and like positive messages and then put the tempered glass over top of it. And I called it self-love. Uh, it was almost symbolic of my process of trying to find that self-love too as a trauma survivor and help myself find the same love that I help other people find in them. Um, so it was really a really insightful process. Mm -hmm. And I know I want to do something else with the mannequin. I don't know what mm -hmm. yet, but <laughs> there's more messages and there's lessons that need to be learned. Uh, <laughs> that's powerful. You know, truthfully, like, um, I... I do that for myself uh, every day uh, because what I've come to learn is that like nobody else is going to do it for you mm -hmm. and when they do it should be more like the cherry on top so an example when my wife tells me hey crow you're beautiful or you're good looking that should be the cherry on top and not me being like yo aren't you gonna amp or pump me up today mm -hmm. you know because we are all working through our own things individually you know mm -hmm. so I've made it like a ritual where every day I wake up and before I step off the, the, the bed, I, I do gratitude work. I'm just thanking the universe for, for being alive, for one, you know, and for having a space to, to rest. And then from there, I just, you know, start with the list of family members that I just, I'm grateful to have. And then I bring it to me like, hey, I'm grateful that, you know, you have a beautiful heart and that I'm grateful that you're doing beautiful work and that you made a commitment to, to to be like a, a, a good person, you know what I mean? Because I feel that since we're not conditioned that way, we're not conditioned to like love ourselves and and um, and be good to ourselves mentally, you know, mm -hmm. and spiritually, for me then it's become a choice. Like I have to choose every day and work at it every day that like, mm -hmm. hey, I gotta give those kudos to me and, and not expect them from nobody, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's also important too, the messages that we're telling ourselves because Sometimes we're, as trauma survivors, we're beating ourselves up every day. We're beating ourselves up more than anybody ever could. And then someone else comes along and says something abrasive to us or harmful that feeds into how we already felt about ourselves. And then it just compounds this like sense of shame. But it's really important for us to start off by not just supporting other people and finding the good in them, but finding the good in ourselves and the strength in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, that's what I'm saying. It's a daily moment to moment practice, at least for me, mm -hmm. daily moment. Because the other thing, honestly, the other thing that's helped me practice moment to moment, to moment is I have four kids, you know what I mean? So especially my younger ones, you know, they want daddy's attention they want to, you know, hang out and I gotta be patient moment to moment. Cause one minute they're, <laughs> they're loving and the next moment they're upset because I, I didn't give them a candy or because what, whatever, you know? So it is this moment-to-moment -moment, um, understanding of self. Mm -hmm. And then if that gauge moves a little bit to the negative side, then you've got to catch it right away and be like, what's moving me? What's moving me? Oh, it's my own thoughts. It's me. I'm giving myself a hard time. Mm -hmm. So there's this theorist, and I'm always talking about this theorist. His name is Winnicott. Uh -huh. um, and he was around, uh, around the time of World War II. And he came up with the concept of the good enough caregiver. Mm -hmm. And um, what he said is that you don't have to be perfect in order to like support a child as they grow, as they develop. You just have to be good enough. Yeah. And I also think about that. Um, so I think about that in the context of my work with mm -hmm. kids, with families. And then I also think about that in the context of myself. I think sometimes we expect ourselves to be perfect and we hold ourselves to this unachievable, unrealistic standard. That's unrealistic. And yeah. we don't praise ourselves yeah. for the good that we're doing. Yeah. Um, instead of saying, uh, I messed up here or I could have done this better, how can we go about saying, I'm good enough? I might not be perfect, but I'm doing the best that I can. I'm moving mm -hmm. forward, I'm pressing on, and I'm good enough. Yeah. We have to. 
You know what I'm saying? Because especially if you are a person that's giving that, that advice, that, that, that care to somebody else and you're propelling them, then we got to be, I feel like a full cup of that within ourselves, right? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for inviting me into your space. And Thank, thank you, you for, for the time to share with us. All right. I'll put on Megan Corrado's uh, Instagram, if that's okay with you. Sure. And that way you can look her up. She's doing amazing work uh, all around. Um, so thank you. Thank you for uh, tuning in.